One, one question that people usually ask uh, when we start, when they start practicing Chisa, ask us is, um, what what has Chisa got to do with realistic fighting? As they say, uh -huh. because in here we don't really put on uh, pads and, and uh -huh. we do like boxing, so uh -huh. they, they think that's more realistic. So, uh -huh. can you explain what, uh -huh. why Chisa? He he said, uh, 通常你你學 Chisa 咧都會有個問題同。真正打交有咩關係？因為佢哋呢度除咗黐手之外，都有帶曬啲保護裝去去試下打咁樣。咁佢哋就會有啲問題，兩者有咩關係呢？正常呢就冇乜嘢關係嘅。但係假如你真係升到條脊骨咧，你隻手會自動去進攻、自動防守嘅，就唔使你我。我敲你邊度打你咁樣唔使做嗰啲嘢，佢自己會做嘅。Normally speaking, they they might be two separate practices, but when you can get a grasp that kind of rising up and and that kind of potential power, all movements are automatic, and you can apply it. Class, have you ever lost a fight? 你師傅你有冇？打好多交啊！打過好多交。嗰陣時俾人幫我師傅教人嗰陣，俾其他各派上嚟叫做踢管啊，叫做撈打，就打好多嗰個時期打。When when I learn Wing Chun under Yip Man, there are other people coming to Yip Man's place to challenge them. So he is he was he has been the one there to guard against the place. Yeah. Sorry. 誒，我你哦，係咪全部都贏我全部只只係我喐下手嘅啫，未試過出兩下嘅。Only just one try and one every every race. Is that because it was too fast, too powerful, or both? 係係你好好係你好誒好好大能量啊，定係好快嘅？好快葉兼有啲能量，即係滲咗入去。佢佢令佢個人震盪，佢咁唔敢再嚟噶啦。哦 ，when when strike onto the body is so fast and so powerful that shock the the person and he he just so scared and can't come and and dare not to come again. Did he use full power or? 我哋冇用全力去打。冇用全力。No no full power. I find it very interesting how the martial art culture was back in the day in Hong Kong in the fifties and sixties. In that the challenge fights were very normal, you know, people will casually challenge. Schools will challenge each other if your martial art was different to someone else. You know, instead of arguing about it on Facebook, you you would go and uh, sort of challenge the other school and 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 see which one is better. Um, there was a lot of challenges between Wing Chun schools as well. And uh, yeah, it's interesting how, like Siegel said in the in the video, that he never actually. He never actually hit someone. He never had to hit someone twice, and he never actually hit with a closed fist. He always hit with a open, open palm because he didn't want to. He didn't want to penetrate too much. And as he said in the video, he never used full power. Um, I asked him once, "Did you ever kick in a fight?" He said, "No, kicks are. It's the, the kicks are too powerful. You know, because the the joints of the legs are much stronger and the legs heavier, so the kicks are too powerful. So he never had to use a kick. If it was in kicking range, it was fast enough to step in and." Uh, and sort of deliver the uh, the palm strike to the chest. He, he also never hit in the face. He always hit in this area or in the body. Um, and his power was enough to sort of shock the person and, and have them not want to continue. Either they fall down or give up or whatever, but, but they never uh, continued. Um, the only time that he did hurt someone, so he never intentionally hurt, hurt, hurt someone, but the only time that someone did get hurt was um, was these Japanese guys came to interview him. These Japanese martial artists came to interview him from Japan and uh, he said at the end, end of the interview, uh, one of them, uh, he, and apparently this guy didn't speak throughout the whole interview, one of them went to shake his hand and as Sigun put out his hand, he tried to uh, sort of flip him or do a move on him or something and as a natural reflex, natural reaction, um, as the guy tried to do that to him, Sigun quickly dropped his arm. He said he simply did a movement like this and he broke the guy's wrist in four places. Um, and he said that was just a reaction. He wasn't, you know, uh, that's why that happened. And uh, actually there was another time where he, he hit more than once. Uh, it's actually my favorite story from all the fighting stories that he said, because he, he had a fair few fights. Not as many fights as um, Wong Shong Lun did or some of his students, people that actually went out, like the Gracies, you know, people that put out open challenges and actually went out and challenged. Uh, Sigan was more sort of, 
defending in that he would just accept challenges. He wouldn't go out of his way to make challenges. So he had a fair few fights, but not um, as many as, the, as some of the other guys. But one of the cool ones that he said is that uh, uh, Wong Chong Long used to go to um, Upper Hill in the New Territories here in Hong Kong. There was a restaurant where it was quite famous for dog meat or something like that. And Wong Chong Long used to go there once a week. And in that area, there was a, there was a b big family, a uh, bunch of relatives where they all they were all laborers. They were all very strong guys from what Siegel said. And they all practiced, uh, I don't know exactly the martial art. I think what, what, what comes to mind is Hong Kun, that, that style of uh, martial art. And um, anyway, this guy, Wong Chong Long by then was quite known, you know, for, for, for being a good fighter. And when he was in a restaurant, this guy came and said, let's, let's, uh, I challenge you, let's fight. Wong Chong said, I don't, I'm not interested. Um, next week, the same guy saw him, come on, let's fight, and not interested. Then Siegel said one day he was in there, and the guy, same guy asked him again, and he said, Wong Chong must have had enough, or he was in a bad mood or something. So he stood up and he said, I was born to be, you were, no, you were born to be defeated by me or something like that. And then he, he, um, he beat him up quite badly. Then Yip Man School got a challenge letter from this group. Um, and Siegel said they accepted the challenge. It was uh, Wong Chong Long, Lok Yu, uh, Siegel, Choi Chong Tin, and uh, Choi Chong Tin's older brother, which only trained for a couple of years under Yip Man. And, and uh, Siegel said actually his brother wasn't a fighter, he wasn't really very good in Wing Chun. So these four people went up to the new territories to sort of accept the challenge. And he said when they got there, there was a, sort of they set up a very professional sort of, they'd, they'd roped off a section and he said there was about 30 of them. There was a lot of them and they were all there. There was only four, four of these guys. Now back in the day, they had good sort of respect for each other in that they wouldn't, you know, 30 people wouldn't jump four people. These days it happens all the time, but there they would, you know, there were sort of rules in that you would not, it would only be a one-on-one -on -one fight. And, um, you know, if it was getting too serious, someone could jump in and say, stop, you know, they could throw in the towel, let's say. So it was, it was bare knuckle, it was a, basically like a street fight, but, you know, not many people got uh, killed. Apparently a couple fell off the rooftop and stuff, but not many people got killed. There was no weapons and it was always one on one. Anyway, so Siegel thought, as soon as they got there, he thought to himself, well, we're going to be very tired. You know, four of us, 30 of them, we're going to start, we're going to have to fight, you know, seven people each. It's going to take all day. So, um, so he said he, the whole time he was thinking, what can he do to sort of not have to fight everyone? First person that went up was, uh, was Wong Chun Long. Uh, fought with the guy and apparently he very easily, very easily defeated him. And Lok Yu went up next. Lok Yu was obviously Wong Chong Long senior. So when he saw Wong Chong Long so easily defeat this guy, he sort of, from what Siegel said, Lok Yu got quite cocky and he, um, he, he said he was just too casual, keeping his hands down and playing around. And uh, the guy that he was fighting actually hit him one, started bleeding, and then he lost his temper and really, really badly hurt this guy. Um, but they all had to jump in and stop it, but he kept going, and so it was quite bad. And then it was Siegel's turn. And then he said, he said it was like in the movies, there was a guy that was sitting there, everyone else was sort of standing around the roped off area, and this guy was sitting with a jacket on his shoulders um, and watching the whole time. Was, he said he was a very big guy. He looked like the leader, you know. Um, and he said like in the movies, he threw off the jacket, stood up, spat on the floor, and then came up, and then uh, Siegel came, went up, and he said this guy, started to sort of move around and dance around him and start to throw fakes and stuff to see what's going on. And Siegel was just standing, not even in a stand, standing with his feet quite close to each other and with his hands up like this. And as the guy was faking, he, he, would, he wasn't budging because the guy wasn't in range and he just, he didn't sense any threat. Um, so he did, it, he did that for a while and then because Siegel wasn't reacting at all, he sort of, he said he stopped, went back to his corner and he was like, talked to the guys like, you know, what should I do? <laughs> Came back again. And then he started to do the same thing again. And this time, Siegel quickly uh, closed the range and threw, he said, threw a very fast punch and stopped like a couple of millimeters from, from his uh, chest. And because it was so fast and so sudden and, and out of nowhere, he sort of did that. The guy 
uh, the, his natural reaction was to hold the arm and try to push, pull, move it around and Seagull was just standing there and he couldn't move, move his arm anyway so he was just standing there and he sort of let go and he went back to his corner and he started asking him, what should I do? He started, you know, uh, talking to his corner and then came back. This time as he came back, as soon as he was uh, close enough, Seagull went in and he said he started to slap all across his body, you know, so through his arms, just bam, 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 started slapping him around. He said it was hard enough for him to sort of feel it, but, um, but it wasn't hurting him. It was just sort of showing that I'm just playing, I can do whatever I want. And as this was happening, the guy sort of covered up and then he's, he bowed and he said, you know, you're, you're, you're a genuine, genuine martial artist and sort of, uh, yeah, he didn't want any more. And then Siegel said, is there anyone else? Anyone else? So he sort of stayed in. He didn't give his brother a turn because he knew his brother, brother can't find it. Is any, anyone else? I'll take anyone else. And everyone stayed quiet. So uh, he said, yes. Yeah, uh, he was thinking the whole time how to not have to fight every, every single one of them. And this is the plan he came up with. Um, and it's quite, and this, this, this is a testimony to, to Siegel's character where, you know, he, with the kind of power, kind of speed he had, he could have... Um, really bully people in, in fights and really hurt people but it, it just shows it goes to show that what kind of man he was that he didn't intentionally hurt anyone and even you know instead of really showing his power and really you know damaging and breaking someone to scare them he thought of it in a different way he showed absolute control by doing something like this um, so yeah that was a that was a uh, that, was, that was definitely my favorite story of his of his uh, fighting times but so this is how Wing Chun was practiced back in those days, and, you know, in, in, uh, in their association, Yip Man's Place, and other martial arts as well. They were all practiced for fighting. There was also close relations with triads. A lot of martial arts schools, Kung Fu schools, had close relations with triads, which would, you know, that would, it was, for them it was life and death, so they had to learn how to fight um, properly. And even when Siegel started teaching himself, as he says in the, in the second DVD he made, the first couple of decades, it was all about fighting. So he would do it through Chisa, but it was all about, you know, fighting, kicking, punching, stuff like that. Then uh, for the last sort of, let's say, two or three decades, he started to change more. The last couple of decades, he started to do more shoulder manipulation, joint manipulation. And the last decade, he just decided not to teach fighting related stuff at all, unless we asked. And he just wanted to pass on Lim Tao. So we were just standing. When I got to Hong Kong, we were just standing, practicing Siu Lim Tao. And it was more the uh, how to find Lim Tao, the mental, sort of the meditative state, the internal side of Wing Chun was mainly focused because he sort of, I, I guess he figured he's, he's, he's going to die soon. So he wanted to pass that essence of it on uh, before, before he passed away. Um, so I, I actually, personally, the, the, reason, the reason why most people start martial arts, I guess, is for self-defense, right? Uh, the reason I started was, was for that as well. I was, uh, you know, being a teenager, I was, when I migrated to Australia already, was, times were hard because I couldn't speak English. Me and my brother, we used to, <laughs> a lot of people would test us. We had to stand up for ourselves. And then becoming a teenager, um, living in the western suburbs of Sydney, there was a lot of, even at school, it was, it was very common to get into uh, punch-ups, you know, and uh, after school or during sports or whatever, and then even on the street in the area we're living in. So. The main reason I, I looked for a martial art, lucky I found Wing Chun, was, um, was to learn how to fight. And when I came over to Hong Kong, and you know, uh, thank God he'd already changed his sort of training, uh, to his teaching to the internal way, when I came here, my whole idea and sort of passion for Wing Chun changed, my understanding of Wing Chun changed. And I realized that actually that, that you know, that, that the self-defense, the fighting aspect, and don't get me wrong, Wing Chun's a, uh, Oh, well, in my opinion, one of the best fighting systems out there because it doesn't have any flurry movements and it's, it's realistic. You know, it's, it's um, different to, I mean, you could use it in a ring, but it's different to that. It's, it's actually realistic. I mean, uh, it's based on center line, which is, you know, hit in the groin, hit in the, if, I mean, it's a life and death situation. And that's why a lot of special forces use this kind of similar techniques rather than stuff that you can't do in the ring, right? So it's very, very useful for self-defense Wing Chun. But... I realized that the self-defense, the fighting aspect is, is really just a, a small branch on the Wing Chun tree in that the main and the more important, in my opinion, benefits that Wing Chun can give you is the, the healing qualities, the mental and physical healing aspects that it can give you. I mean, really, I mean, there's, there was, I'll, I'll, I'm going to make another video about this, but 
uh, witness spines that doctors are told, you know, people that their spines will never straighten out, they had back pain, people had back pain for decades, neck pain, that all went away after a uh, you know, few hundred or a couple of thousand hours of standing and, and practicing the, in the right way. I witnessed this. Um, there's, a, there's a person which, uh, one of my best friends and also a fellow guy that came at the same time, trained under Choi Chun Tin, Sebastian, um, one of his uh, students uh, was sort of bipolar and he was, he was on medications for a long, long time. You know, this is, a, this, this is a mental aspect. And after doing the internal training with, with Sebastian, he, he doesn't take medication anymore. This is a big thing. It's a life-changing thing. So it's not just all theoretical. This is real stuff that, um, real healing that has taken place and I've, I've witnessed it actually, not just within myself, but within others. So to me, this, this benefit of Wing Chun is uh, these sort of branches of, of the Wing Chun tree are much bigger and much more important and much more life-changing um, and in, uh, compared to the fighting fighting don't get me wrong the fighting it's still a martial art you know and it depends what, what are you in it for I mean uh, at Mindful Wing Chun I'd say 30% of the people we get the older ladies and stuff like that they're not into going out there and going to the pub and getting to a pub brawl right they're, they're into really uh, de-stressing and getting rid of unnecessary tension and things like that. But there is, of course, the students that are into fighting. Now, I teach people uh, Muay Thai, people that get in the ring. Their, their, their style is Muay Thai, their style, there's, uh, there's a group that comes, karate um, and Sancha group that comes from Australia twice or once a year. Um, they, they have been for the last four years and I teach them how to better their game in terms of their ring fighting using these, how to hit harder, hit faster using their internal sort of aspects of joint rotation, using your body mass, etc. So it depends on which direction you want to go with Wing Chun. But one thing I want to make clear that if you do want to get better at fighting, this is something that needs to be practiced. Because the reason I'm saying is because in the last decade that Sigmund was teaching, or there's maybe maybe the same case in some other internal arts, some people say that, no, you know, I'll just stand here and as I stand and, and do my internal stuff and, and you know, I, I relax and I can get power that way, in a fight I'll just use that and hit once and the guy's, the guy's finished if I can work on just you know, one, one, one hit knockouts. That's not really the case because if, if, in a fight there's so many variables. Um, I myself unfortunately have <laughs> had, uh, experienced a lot of altercations when I was, when I was younger, when I was a teenager. I got into very serious uh, sort of situations between the ages of, let's say, 14, 15 until about 18. Um, in many serious fights, I'm, I'm, let's say I'm lucky to be alive. Uh, I was only hospitalized once and quite badly. Uh, in that fight that I was hospitalized, we got, the four of us got jumped by six carloads, so about around 25, 30 people. And uh, one of my closest friends at the time was only 15, I was 17. He, um, uh, yeah, he got stabbed three times in the lungs, so, so yeah, so we lost him, you know, so uh, things, and that wasn't the only sort of serious, that kind of fight that I was unfortunately involved in. Um, so I went through that, and then at 18, I became a bouncer for a few years, and for the first couple of years, I was bouncing in, the, in Sydney's King's Cross, which which is not, uh, which is a, you know, trouble does happen. People come there, usually the after parties, you know, they go to clubs and then after parties they come there. So people were very intoxicated and, and it was a sort of a no man's land, you know, it's, it wasn't a su suburb, so people came from everywhere, you know, and, uh, and naturally I had, to, I had to defend myself for my job. So um, I got my experience in fighting from, from, from the past, but that's why when I hear people saying, oh, I will just stand here and relax and move, and you know, I learn how to move powerfully, and they can sort of, you know, I'm talking about even in, in our own lineage. Some people, if you hold them, push on them, they can seemingly effortlessly move their arm, and you go flying back. So they can show that they have power coming out of their body. But I think because maybe because they haven't been in a realistic situation, they don't understand that that doesn't. It's different in a fight. You know, fear comes, and you get adrenaline dump, and uh, and. You know, people could be coming from all around. There's, there's, there's so many variables. So, if you do want to learn how to utilize your internal wind or external wind in a realistic situation, there needs to be, you have to have fights. I'm not saying go out there and start fights, start trouble. Um, one level below that, you have to, there has to be aspects of sparring, you know, so uh, sort of realistic sparring, putting mouth guards and, and um, 
maybe not, not even gloves, sparring properly or even chi sao sparring properly, that aspect needs to be there because you're, you need to get used to being hit and, and, and so you don't get uh, overtaken by fear when it does happen on the street. Um, but having gone through this kind of training now in the last, in the last decade, in, in the internal training, I start to realize that now for, for even for sparring, for self-defense, for me, it's, it's now, the, so, sparring or self-defense becomes a test of that Siwum Tao state, of that relaxation, mindful state. So when I'm, when I'm sparring, it's, I'm, I'm thinking, not thinking, okay, how do I get in and hit him here? And how do I do the footwork and, and, and sort of all this kind of stuff? I'm not in that state. I'm trying to be in the Siwum Tao state, in that relaxed, calm state where you can still think clearly and make decisions properly rather than, you know, getting that adrenaline dump. And as it's happening, for me, it's a test of how can I maintain the relaxation, you know. Um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a different sort of thing. And I found that teaching people self-defense in this way, people tend to, looking at it from a test of your relaxed state or that, that mindful state, people tend to um, develop that aggression that you, that you can naturally develop through sparring, which I developed through, you know, you sort of get addicted to the adrenaline of the, when I was bouncing, you sort of, I was going out every weekend and you sort of not look for trouble, but you're, you're ready for it and you're sort of ho you're hoping for it, you know, in some way, because it's a, it's, I mean, chemicals are happening, there's, there's chemical uh, sort of intake in the brain when adrenaline comes, so you start to get used to that and you start to look for that you know and and out of that aggression builds that's why people go out a lot of martial artists i mean i i'll speak for myself when i was younger and and the people that i hung out with you sort of go out and you're on the lookout you know a little at a drop of a hat you're like yeah all right let's go let's fight you know which can uh turn into other complications so i found that approaching the self-defense and inspiring uh, aspects of wing chun from that ceiling tower that mindfulness state uh, tends to help us not develop that sort of aggressive um, mindset, you know. So, in fact, it goes the other way. So, we, we, are, we are learning relaxation, mindfulness, sort of de-stressing, calming the body, healing our body and mind with Silum Tao. And we're trying to take that state, whether it's into Chi Sao, into practicing the wooden dummy, into our daily lives and into a self-defense situation. So, everything becomes, even, let's say, a violent situation, becomes a test of that um, mindful state, you know. Um, so, yeah. So, I, I really, I really recommend, you know, in, in in your training, if you can try to try to find f or look for uh, a mindful state in your Silum Tao. Practice Silum Tao daily. There was just a, a, a re recently last week. Um, I saw a video of Sifu Derek Fong, which is one of the early students of Yip Man. In fact, he was one of the last students remaining of Yip Man in the, from the association from that uh, 50s, you know, from the early on times um, before Bruce Lee's time. So, where he said, Yip Man told him, practice Yunim Ta every day. Practice Yunim Ta every single day. There's something in that. You'll find something in that. Explore. And this is the state that I'm talking about. It's not just a theoretical thing. It's something very tangible, very real. And once you find that state, you understand what I mean, where you can start to look for that state or maintain that state even when you're doing self-defense, fighting, stuff like that. As a result, you'll be able to be less aggressive, try to avoid fights where you can, naturally, because you're in a calmer state. You'll be able to think clearly, you'll be able to see rather than getting that tunnel vision of that one person that you're going to fight and you won't see his friends coming, you know. And, uh, and also, of course, you become, you'll be able to utilize your fighting skills better because you can because you're more relaxed you're more powerful and faster as well so so yeah this is how i think i think it's a it's a it's a good step to take with our self-defense inspiring training bringing that internal side into that as well